And I believe we are set up and running. We look to have um, uh, 200 online. They look to be pouring in rather quickly now. You can't even keep up with the count. So we're just going to kick it right on off. Good morning and happy Tuesday to everyone. Uh, I hope all is well with you and yours where you are. Today is Tuesday, January 19th. It's yet another crisp day here in North Florida. I was this close to uh, firing up the fireplace. And then I said, well, I'll just bring my computer in there and I'll have the fireplace over my shoulder like Jim Nance at the Masters and just say hello, friends. But uh, welcome to this, the 56th session in our little webinar experiment, the 2020 FDOT Transportation Symposium webinar series. Um, today, we are going to be hearing from Mr. AC Roberts, the Traffic Operations Division Manager for WGI, and Mr. Glenn Havanovisky, the Transportation Technology Lead for WGI. And then we're going to be talking about smart work zones. Uh, this session will focus on how connected and autonomous technology is being integrated into construction work zones in Florida and beyond. It's going to be good. All attendees will be in listen-only mode for this webinar. Please submit any questions you have to the question dialog box. We will attempt to answer questions at the QA session at the end of the presentation, for, so stay on for that. It is our intention to record this presentation and post it to the Transportation Symposium website. That's the same website as you access the registration link for this session, transportationsymposium.fdot.gov. Continuing education credit will be issued to those who attend the live session and who attend the session in its entirety. Certificates will be emailed to the email address which you registered and logged on to this webinar with. And with that, I am going to turn it over to these gentlemen and we'll kick it on off. Mr. Roberts, do you have, there it is. All right, I'm gonna mute on out and I'm here if you need me or I'll talk to you at the end. So you got my screen up here, no problems. Is that good, Brian? Yes, sir. We see your desktop. Okay, so like we're going to talk outside about of Spaceship Earth. Yeah. So we're going to talk about uh, smart work zones today. Uh, again, I'm AC Roberts uh, with Wantman Group, uh, leading uh, our Tismo team uh, here in Tampa. I'm joined by Glenn Havanovinsky with our uh, Traffic Technologies team. Uh, he leads our national office uh, in Virginia wanted to talk a little bit about just, just the, the history, just a short background of smart work zones, uh, go into some of uh, some, some you know, spotlight projects, show the current state of practice. Definitely want to hit the future technology is really the focus of this to what's coming next, what can we do here in Florida going forward uh, to take advantage of all the great technology that we've already started to implement here along our highways and, uh, and, and you know, what maybe some other states that might be listening in uh, what they can do, uh, as, as well as what Florida can do for policy uh, recommendations or possibly changes uh, to accommodate that in the future. So most everybody on the line would understand, uh, you know, smart work zones fairly well. But for those that don't, uh, you know, smart work zones are becoming smarter work zones and will probably soon be some version of a connected or autonomous work zone. Uh, but the general definition remains the same in order for work zones to be smart or to be intelligent uh, it's really important that there be uh, you know provide real-time information to, to you know the detection is really important to be able to, to have the detection of vehicles and, and motorists in the right location uh, to have enough of that detection so that you can you know ad adequately uh, measure and know what's going on on the, on the interstate system and then to be able to respond to that um, that also is vitally important that that you know, that the, those devices are portable uh, as lanes change and as phases of construction changes, you know, you've got to be able to move those things around and, and to be able to put them in the right place. Uh, it needs to be automated. You know, these systems can't really rely on, on human operators to make decisions in real time. Some of this, you know, these decisions and these messages and the, and the uh, signal timings or, or BMS messages have to be pre-programmed and pre-decided uh, you know, to be able to kick off based on either speed or volume of traffic or you know, potential incidents or accidents. You know, that has to be automated so that they can uh, provide quick information to the public and quick information back to the, to the agency's operators. And certainly it has to be reliable in order for uh, the public to, to really 
you know, use the information and to respect the information, you know, they've got to know that, that it's right. A lot of the motorists that travel through these work zones are going to be doing so once or twice a day. And so it's going to be very obvious if the travel time message is incorrect, if the uh, speed limit signs are incorrect, if the uh, lane change messaging is not, you know, uh, does not reflect the actual lane change up ahead. So, you know, communication, coordination with the contractors, all those things are really viable or, or vital to having a, a, a very functional and effective work zone. So some of the components that you'll find, you know, today in work zones, you know, are basically ITS devices as far as uh, your your traffic components, your your message boards, portable message boards, variable message, variable speed limit signs, certainly your detection, whether that's through a radar side fire detection or video, and your camera monitoring systems. But going forward in the future, we're going to see you know some different types of devices. You might even see you know five C five G small cell devices uh, where you know, seeing some of these uh, agencies start to talk about, you know, creating their own communication networks inside of that work zone, uh, just so you can control the communication, uh, the, the broadband bandwidth that's available in that area. Uh, you want to be able to communicate to the vehicles connected and autonomous vehicles that are becoming a larger and larger piece of the motorist, uh, you know, traffic on the, on the interstate system. And if you have that kind of bandwidth, you can start to do things more digitally yourselves as contractors and, and agencies, you know, you kind of reduce the paperwork, you start to do things, uh, you know, via email and, and uh, web applications and, and digital forms rather than having a lot of, you know, CNI paperwork and forms that we used to have. So why are work zones uh, safety so important? Well. As we all know, as volumes increase, uh, even even during COVID, you know the speeds have increased, so accidents have not decreased. Uh, even going back to certainly 1617 and and some of the preliminary data, even for 2020, uh, you know we're not seeing positive numbers in, in crashes and accidents. Um, you know as as time changes, we're starting to see uh, more and more bicycle and pedestrian accidents. Uh, we're starting to see. Uh, a larger percentage of the accidents are involving trucks uh, or buses. And that could be from a, a number of things, more commercial traffics on the roadway or, or more uh, construction trucks, you know, in and out of the, the free flow lanes of traffic. So there's a lot of things to be learned from crash data. And the number one thing is that we just need to provide, you know, a greater level of safety. And certainly uh, I don't want to forget how important enforcement is for uh, for work zones. It's a difficult thing to try to you know line up enforcement and, and you know provide enforcement every day on work zones. But uh, some states are not embracing you know virtual enforcement. But that is an option uh, for a lot of our states. A lot of our clients uh, are looking to to use uh, speed enforcement, you know, camera enforcement in work zones, and uh, you know whether you appreciate that or not it, it's a very effective way of, of uh, getting people's attention when they're going through work zones. I wanted to bring uh, attention to a North Carolina DOT study that was recently published a research paper that they recently put out they had a long-term um, crash analysis of, uh, of work zones in, just in the North Carolina DOT but it's pretty indicative of what you're seeing uh, nationwide where you know, most of the accidents are occurring from that rush hour time uh, through the night as construction you know, is more and more, you know, performed at night. Um, you know, you're starting to see more crashes at night and you think you have lower volumes at night. We also have higher speeds. So sometimes those accidents can be more dangerous and more, you know, more injurious to both uh, the work zone, you know, construction team and the and the motorists. Also, um, you know, as you can see here, location of the work zones, starting to see uh, you know, most of this, most of these accidents occur either right at the beginning of the, the taper of the construction, you know, maybe a lane change or construction area, and before the work zone. As you can see, slightly more than half occur in that area, and, and some even occur before the first sign uh, of construction. And so that can be a, a very difficult situation to manage when, when you know they're 
you're starting to see backups occur outside of the work zone or your slowdowns occur outside of the work zone and motorists uh, you know, not recognizing the slowdown. So I'm gonna bring Glenn in to talk a, a little bit about some of the current projects or, or most recent projects that have been completed around the country that are indicative of you know, current state of practice and um, let Glenn take it from here. Thanks very much, AC, and good morning, everybody. Um, one of the things that's always important when you talk about state of the practice is, especially with smart work zones, is one size does not fit all. As you're going to see, there are different applications that may have particular benefits for that particular application, but you may do something completely different in another state or in a, on another type of roadway. So this example of a large scale project that I'm gonna talk about right now is in Colorado. This was the widening of the eastbound bore of the, uh, the Eisenhower tunnels along Interstate 70. If you, if you go skiing out in Colorado, west of Denver, you go to Aspen or Breckenridge, especially Breckenridge is pretty close there. Uh, you'll find that I-70 can be, especially during a snowstorm, there's an accident or a closure or road work as it happened here, you don't wanna be stranded there. And there's not a whole lot of uh, options to get from point A to point B when you go through a mountain range. There are some options, which is why you had on 30 miles on either side of the tunnel, you had dynamic message signs, you had cameras, you had Bluetooth sensors for travel time information. And then you provided all that information uh, on the web so people can make decisions even before they began the trip. And so you were looking at not just the work zone itself, but the entire area around the work zone. So next, next uh, slide. So as you can tell here, they basically had one bore was completely closed up and then you were running two-way traffic uh, in the westbound direction. Uh, one of the things that was found uh, as a lesson learned was cameras were the biggest benefit of all. Uh, you can provide maps, you can provide advisory information. Cameras basically will tell the public, this is what's happening. They can look at it. They can, they can, they can tell with their own eyes what's, uh, what's going on. So this was something that was really, really useful. Ideally, if you've already got cameras, or if you've already got dynamic message signs along the corridor, you can use those and you can reduce the costs of providing uh, 30 miles worth, worth of equipment. But it is very, very valuable to provide all this type of information uh, so you look at not just the work zone itself, the safety within the work zone, which is obviously paramount, but the information uh, that will lead you to decide which way are you going to go to get there, as well as, well, am I going to make that trip to begin with? So let's go to the next slide. This next example is, uh, it's actually about 10 years old, but it's a very good example of, of programmatically how a smart work zone policy can improve a particular corridor. Uh, Illinois Department of Transportation uh, was doing quite a bit of work along Interstate 55 northeast of St. Louis. Uh, so what they did is they instituted a smart work zone program, but they did it uh, in a staged fashion. 2010, uh, they basically did a bunch of construction projects. You can take to the next, next slide. That did not use smart work zones. So there was an evaluation of what was the, uh, the, the traffic conditions, number of accidents, uh, et cetera. The following year, and we'll go to 2011 season, you had a similar number of projects in the same corridor where smart work zones were deployed. And so you saw the statewide program, which included uh, dynamic message signs, cue warning, cameras, uh, and, other, and other detection. And they followed the federal guidelines for implementing smart work zones with a real-time information. So on the next slide, we can see what the benefits were. And one of the things that's very important to begin with is that between 2010 and 2011, while you had the same mileage of, of construction, you had a lot more lane closures in 2011 than 2010, uh, 540 days worth of lane closures. As a result, you actually had many more vehicles that were impacted 
by the work zone and by the construction. So you had about 25% more vehicles that were exposed to the construction. Then you look at the statistics, you look at there were actually fewer property damage accidents, um, slightly fewer injury accidents, and, and quite, a, quite a bit less in terms of queuing accidents. And this is despite the fact that you had 25% more volume. So certainly a smart work zone can, if not redu reduce uh, the number of accidents, which is I or crashes, which is which is ideal. Uh, it certainly is going to uh, keep things under control versus normal conditions, and will minimize uh, as much as possible the exposure of workers to vehicles. Uh, protects the work zone, also providing real time information for alternate routes if you've got a significant amount of congestion. So this was an example, 2010, 2011. Uh, where here, here is the direct result of implementing smart work zones. So next. This next project is one that I had some involvement in uh, in, in many of the early stages uh, in, in my previous life. This is a, a project done in Orange County, California, that has a lot of similarities to a project in Orange County, Florida called Ultimate I-4. Uh, this is the Interstate 405 freeway in Los Angeles. Uh, the ADT of this road in the north end is about 400,000. No, I'm not adding an, an extra zero. There really is 400,000 ADT on the north end of I-405. And then the, the less crowded part of the corridor is 300,000 ADT. So you had basically one HOV lane in each direction, and then you had four to five mixed flow lanes. They added another mixed flow lane on the right side, and they added another lane on the left to create two express lanes in both directions. It is a five year long project and involves interchange closures. It involves closures of the ent entire directions of the freeway at particular points. So just doing a standard work zone, just monitoring what's going on is just, is just not gonna cut it. You need to be able to manage the operation in real time. Keeping in mind also that Caltrans District 12 has a very elaborate uh, traffic management system along every interstate highway, including ramp metering at hundreds and hundreds of locations in the district, uh, as well as along Interstate 405, meant that you had to maintain some kind of traffic, real-time traffic operational capability, even if you were ripping the detectors out. Part of what was done was relocating CCTV cameras to the newer location so that you can use CCTV cameras, but where you can't relocate the traffic sensors because of the construction. You use information from third parties. The INRIXs, the, the HERES, the Googles, and the Wazes of the world provide an awful lot of information that's very useful. Travel time data, as well as uh, where incidents are located, where the bottlenecks are located. And uh, if you look at the next slide, uh, one of the things that you are able to do is combine the data into a, a single database. And in this case, they used a, a, data, a traffic analytics system uh, that could actually combine the data so that you could consolidate the information both from the sensors that were working as well as the, the live data you were getting from different sources. And then you could utilize that information, look at the trends, and determine whether or not you needed to divert traffic onto other freeways. And if you're familiar with Southern California, uh, although it can be a congested mess, one of the amazing things is people also travel 30 or 40 miles and you can actually use alternate freeways to get from point A to point B. So effectively, this interim operation system was integrated with the real-time traffic management that was being done elsewhere in the district so that you've got a long-term smart work zone in place because of the length of this project, but you're using, you've got, still got real-time data flowing through this system. So you can provide the appropriate queue warning information. You can provide the appropriate alternate route information. Next. And in the case of Pennsylvania Turnpike, as you can tell, safety is a big concern, uh, especially for moving operations. So the Pennsylvania Turnpike saw an opportunity uh, to look at connected vehicle technology. How can they communicate work zone information 
to vehicles right before they approach the work zone. Give them a quarter mile so they can they can they get the immediate information and can act immediately on it. This is a case where you're not looking at alternate routes. You're looking at here's here's a moving operation in a rural stretch of the turnpike. Uh, here are some smart work zones that you need to put up uh, on sections of the turnpike where you may be doing widening, you may be doing other work, uh, but you may not have uh, the practical ability to divert traffic. So providing cue warning information, providing warning information that there's a lane closed up ahead and here's the action you need to take was something that they wanted to do. So this was about two, three years ago that Penn Turnpike did this. They equipped uh, the, their maintenance trucks. They had the truck with the arrow board on it as well as the cones and everything else. Uh, they equipped it with an onboard unit that had both the SRC uh, and cellular V2X capability. There were about 20 test vehicles that they had in their fleet that also had onboard units that could receive the data. So there were really two, there were two resources for information that, that, that existed. One was being able to provide the information inside the vehicle using uh, the, uh, the safety message that was transmitted via the onboard units. The other option was using cellular V2X communication to communicate with a cloud server that cloud server communicated both with Penn Turnpike's own software called TripTalk, as well as Waze. So, and the key to this was the operator did not need to interact with this. This was something that was completely automated that was handled by the OBU. So how did it work? Next slide. Well, first of all, you, you had um, the technology worked reasonably well. One of the challenges was with the actual physical location of the truck, you couldn't really differ. The GPS accuracy at the time was not that you could differentiate whether it's in the right lane or the left lane. The key was making sure that directionally you weren't sending information to the wrong direction. And uh, in general, it worked quite well. Uh, it took a few months for ways to have confidence in the data that was being provided from the truck, but eventually about five, six months after the, the testing had begun, Waze was beginning to utilize the information from the trucks using the standard interface that was being developed at the time with the Illinois Tollway and with the assistance from Federal Highway Administration. Uh, so the formatting of the data so that it can appear on Waze obviously needs to be standardized. They don't wanna have one standard for Penn Turnpike, the other for Illinois, another one for Florida DOT, uh, so the standardization is gonna be something that's gonna be very important. And especially with the changes that are occurring now uh, with uh, at, at the FCC level with the SRC fading, the cellular V to X element's gonna become even more important going forward. So I will turn it back over to AC. All right, thank you, Glenn. Uh, so now we'll talk about uh, some of the future technology and some future use cases and demos that are going on. Um, you know, maybe in the near future and some a little further out. Uh, some you'll be familiar with as Florida is doing, uh, some of the cities and the agencies, uh, districts are doing some of the SPAT testing right now and, and interfacing with uh, Audi as well as other manufacturers. Uh, Virginia DOT did this uh, in a work zone uh, recently and developed this uh, using Qualcomm's uh, onboard units and, and roadside units to, to provide um, you know, signal phase and timing information along arterials and parallel routes of work zones um, to, you know, attempt to uh, reduce, you know, the time and delay through signalized corridors, as you are probably familiar with this. This is, can provide a pretty big uh, advantage for, for traveling, platooning traffic through uh, work zones if they, you know, have an idea about when uh, signals are going to turn green or turn red, and it just helps shave off a few seconds, you know, the beginning and ending of some of these cycles. And, um, certainly can reduce, you know, the hard braking and, uh, and rear end collisions that occur sometimes at, at interchange, at, you know, signalized corridors. Another, uh, you know, obvious CV um, section or, or functionality is, is for cue warning. Um, as we talked about earlier, looking at crash numbers, the majority of crashes do occur, you know, at the beginning when traffic starts to slow down around work zones, around lane changes and, and merges. 
Um, so as, as connected vehicles become more and more uh, involved and, and ubiquitous into the traffic network, it's really important that we're able to get that safety messaging out early uh, to let them know way ahead of time, you know, miles ahead of time that there's a work zone up ahead, you know, to, to start adjusting your speed if that's possible to allow, you know, free flow of traffic at a lower speed. Uh, you know, so, but it's all about detection, having proper detection, uh, having correct, you know, placement of that detection so that you, so that operators at the agency as well as travelers in the area know uh, where this accident, where the slowdown is, uh, potentially where an incident is. And it can also quickly notify, you know, agencies of, a, of an accident or, or a slowdown or a stoppage. Overall, you know, if we, the, by reducing this, you know, traveler information or, or incident management process, you know, you're just reacting faster to incidents, you're getting emergency personnel faster to the accident, and certainly clearing that that uh, that slowdown faster, which overall can increase your average speed through the work zone. Uh, looking at, uh, this is more of a formal use case of that Pennsylvania project uh, using a connected vehicle uh, you know, approach for merge assist and, and for slow trucks and work zones. And, you know, using onboard units, connecting using V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle communication uh, can allow them, those vehicles to, to, you know, quickly notify uh, or quickly recognize that slow traffic, slow truck in the lane. Uh, this is one of the most dangerous, you know, parts of a work zone when you have, you know, a, a really large, you know, construction vehicle uh, dump truck or or other you know slow moving equipment in a work zone uh, when you know traffic is doing you know any any speed at all. I mean a 30 mile an hour you know accident into the back of a dump truck is is horrific. You know so we need to uh, really focus on how we can make this safer and using V2V uh, communication using some of the the traveler alert uh, driver alert systems that are already in a lot of the newer cars uh, can really benefit that. It also can uh, connect the onboard units of the construction trucks will also connect to PCMS boards automatically putting those messages on the screen that there's something up ahead and you can automatically connect to variable speed limits as well to try to start platooning that traffic or change that traffic uh, speed through the work zone. Uh, some newer data solutions and, and platforms and dashboards that that we're seeing uh, this is a, a system from Urban SDK here in Florida. They uh, have a pretty good uh, platform, kind of off the shelf platform for arterial management and traffic management uh, for arterial route or parallel routes and, and you know ICM solutions for work zones. Um, you know, as as depending on the size of the project, you're going to have a lot of uh, vehicles pull off of these interstate routes and avoid the work zone. So that just puts increasing pressure on our arterial networks and our larger uh, systems, you know, either whether that's a downtown area or, or a suburb area. Uh, so it's really important that we're able to monitor, you know, a large area of the city or the construction work area to uh, help us identify slowdowns as they're occurring using heat maps, using some color coded systems with uh, you know, you have a lot of options uh, with the data and the GIS systems. Uh, you can also set up your own, uh, you know, performance measures, your own performance indicators, whatever your agency wants to, uh, to measure, uh, whether that's in real time or, you know, to have that data over a long period of time so that you can measure against historical data, uh, measure against other work zones, uh, you know, use that for long-term planning, use that for long-term term studies and research projects. Uh, because it's all about proving that the systems that we're using, you know, are effective and that they are reducing, you know, uh, crashes, they are increasing safety. So being able to prove our, our effectiveness of this information, these, these tools is, is really important, not only to the DOT and the higher ups within the DOT, but to the public as well. So uh, this, these systems can also be used uh, for you know, your adaptive signal systems, responsive signal systems, um, you know, and other adjacent programs, you know, whether that be an arterial system or the interstate system. And looking further into the future, um, you know, there's all sorts of new research going on with machine learning, um, large, you know, artificial intelligence systems regarding 
traffic networks. Traffic networks um, over a large area is a really difficult uh, system or a really difficult problem set to solve because just the sheer, sheer computing factor you know, needs to, to control and monitor and adjust you know traffic signal timings over you know more than 25 signal systems is is really gets to be almost more than a typical computer can handle so there's a lot of research going on into cloud computing uh you know, we, uh, you know large data set computer big data uh, hadoop type you know uh, processes where they're actually competing uh you know, uh, controlling larger areas. And as that research gets better and as that technology gets better, um, you know, you're going to have, uh, be able to control and, and have responsive signal systems over a much larger area, which, which solves a lot of the problems when you have, uh, you know, complete shutdowns of interstates or if there's, you know, a, a large lane closure on the work zone and you just have to divert traffic through secondary interstates and arterials. Uh, you know, you got to be able to quickly respond, quickly change those signal timings and, and operators and traffic, you know, operators, even if they're standing in the field at those signal cabinets, are just not going to be able to respond fast enough. They're not going to be able to change all these signals, you know, simultaneously. So that's what is great about the future promise of, of you know, the machine learning systems is that you'll have a, a real adaptive network, um, not just of, you know, 12 or 15 signals, but of maybe 200, 300 signals, you know, all working together. And the great, uh, you know, future we hope will, uh, and what is really going into research and development and something that we're really focused on is the bicycle and pedestrian. That has to be considered, that has, the detection has to improve there. But uh, as that does, as that technology does improve, they'll be a, a, also a big part of those decisions that are being made in the field on timing, on progression, and on how the uh, pedestrians and bicyclists get through the, these work zones. So there's a lot to unpack here and a lot to discuss um, for the for the state agencies and, and communities that we work with. So I'm gonna let Glenn talk about a little bit more specific on how we can get from you know the future technology and all the cool safety tools that are available to how we can actually see this start uh, you know being implemented in the field. Thanks, AC. Thanks. Uh, I think the technology, the technology stuff really, uh, there's always been the, the push and pull between what do we need and what's available. There are, there are a lot of products for work zones uh, that, you know, claim to be out of the box. And certainly you can, you can buy stuff that's, uh, that includes a package of interfaces to uh, portable DMSs, uh, travel time information from Bluetooth. Uh, as well as and cameras, portable cameras with cellular communications or wireless or Wi-Fi. So there are a lot of different products out there, but it's important, um, as with any type of ITS deployment, to look at what your needs are. It is a systems engineering process. Uh, it's going to be driven by your needs. One of the big needs, for example, for the Interstate 405 project was to keep delays due to construction to 30 minutes or less uh, on a 16 mile long corridor. That may seem, wow, 30 minutes. But when you consider how much congestion there normally is, there was a potential to have even more delay on that corridor. And do everything, and the key is to do everything possible if you have that goal to make sure that you can achieve that goal. There are many ways you can do it. One is improving the flow through the corridor by providing cue warning information so that your people are driving more safely and they're not standing on the driving too fast and then standing on the brakes. Another is providing uh, diversions to alternate routes or even uh, alternate modes, trying to integrate within a larger framework. So the other policies might be controlling the number of crashes. Obviously, vision zero is in play here. You don't want any crashes. So trying to create a perfectly safe work zone, not just for the vehicles, but also for the workers. Let's not, let's not uh, discount that. One of the things that you're trying to do with a work zone is protect the workers uh, as well. You may need to maintain a certain minimum level of traffic volume, especially for things such as, uh, for such as freight uh, movements. There may not be adequate capacity on alternate routes, so you need to maintain a certain level of volume, a certain number of lanes. 
So all those things will play into what it is that you're going to procure, how big your work zone is going to be. Are you going to actually be providing stuff as, as happened in Colorado, 30 miles out from the actual work zone, so you can actually divert people or help them make decisions on whether or not to even make the trip. So let's go to the next slide. Sharp 2, uh, NCHRP Sharp 2 came up with a 400-page a document called Strategies for Work Zone Transportation Management Plans, where it basically identified what are the things that you need to do to incorporate into a smart work zone plan, and then look at different options. What are the different things uh, that are playing into the corridor that you're working on? Do you have a case where you're having to deal with extreme weather? Uh, do you have existing ITS that you can leverage from? Uh, do you have a situation where the geometrics are really, really bad? You need to take into consideration uh, the limitations of capacity, lack of shoulder, whether you have a curve that's going to slow, naturally slow traffic down. How do we lay out the work zone? How do we prepare people for the work zone? And what are the kind? What's the kind of information that we need to provide? So. TechStop, for example, has a go, no-go decision tool with regard to what are the different things that we're going to do in implementing uh, the smart work zone. So you could score different technologies or score different strategies based on the variety of underlying issues that might exist. And Sharp 2 has a variety of different tools, including uh, software to help you make decisions in terms of planning your smart work zone. So next slide. So the key is there's also the FHWA documentation on work zone implementation. Um, it provides typical information for laying out the work zone, both internally uh, as well as uh, information in the surrounding areas. Uh, smart work zones, not every state implements smart work zones as a mandatory part of what it is that they do. Uh, obviously, if you're looking at a freeway network, if you're looking at a network which is already being heavily surveilled or has uh, a, a large amount of volume or a large number of accidents, you certainly want to consider using technology, smart work zones, as part of your MOT or TMP plans. It should become really a standard part of it if you've already got a, a, a network that's already instrumented with ITS or that connects into a network that's already instrumented with ITS. And even if it's not, it provides, there's a great deal of benefit because of the safety element, but also as well because of the, the real-time information elements. So those things should all be considered before bidding. If you're doing a design build project, have a set of performance measures that the contractor needs to achieve, whether it's the the 30 minutes, 30 minutes uh, limit with regard to uh, a work zone related delay. That was a performance uh, requirement for the I-405 project that the uh, design build contractor had to achieve. So because of that, that was why they did a relatively elaborate system. Uh, because if they didn't, they could they could get liquidated damages if they're not meeting the performance measures. So it puts the safety responsibility on the contractor can also put financial responsibility uh, on the contractor as well to meet those requirements. And then finally, the public needs to be aware that uh, the work that FDOT or anybody else is doing to control uh, the situation within a work zone, they need to be aware that they need to do their part. Don't go 80 miles an hour when the speed in the work, in the work zone is 40 miles an hour. Provide the information prepare them for what's going to come, um, do a promotion, whether it's a game of cones, as you see there, or some other information. Make sure your PR people are working with uh, the contractor to make sure that it is a you have a structured uh, work zone management scheme that's in place that everybody is aware of and that everybody, the more information you're providing the public, the better, because if you're not providing information and they're surprised, the last thing the public wants is a surprise. Give them and manage their expectations um, 
And this is a great way of doing it. Keep reminding them, reminding them, hey, there's a work zone here. We're working to make it work better, but you got to do your part. Um, these are the signs. When it says go 40 miles an hour, go 40 miles an hour. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to AC to wrap up. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, just to reiterate that, uh, some of the other um, you know, implementation uh, lessons learned I've seen uh, from my former days at uh, the state agency was, uh, you know, I can't uh, emphasize enough how much uh, public relations and marketing plays into uh, into construction. People are just naturally really, you know, interested in construction projects. I mean, everybody thinks that they're a contractor. Everybody thinks that they're an engineer. And, you know, if you get them on your side with social media, with, you know, marketing campaigns, uh, commercials, uh, the, the websites, the apps, I mean, people, you know, there's a certain percentage of people that will, always complain but I mean most people will really you know appreciate the information and they and they like the the interaction with the public you know we are you know all working for a public agency at, at some level and so uh, having having uh, even marketing people come in and run your social media page have you know social media pages just for those projects or websites just for those projects or or apps or you know provide, uh, you know, onboard units uh, for motorists that travel through that work zone frequently, you know, so that they can have additional information and feel like they're a part of, you know, data collection and a part of the solution uh, to what our, our state agency is doing. Uh, you know, all those things are, are really, um, you know, unseen and it's hard to see that, you know, prove the benefits, but uh, I can tell you, it, it, you know, it really does make a difference between you know, the, the public uh, accepting your policies and accepting your program and really fighting against you. And, you know, just some other things about uh, construction planning, construction plan development is, you know, if you have some specific demos, some specific projects that you want to try, you, know, you really have to get smart about your specifications and how you write that into a project. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to to spell that out specifically and exactly what you want to contractors that may not have as much technical knowledge of, of ITS as we do. Uh, so you really want to think about that uh, and get the, the specifications and your standard plans and documents right. So when it goes out to bid, everybody's bidding, you know, apples to apples, uh, putting the same, you know, uh, smart work zone. Uh, if, if it's like a demo device, you know, that you're getting exactly what you're asking for. So, you know, that's, that's no, Nothing new there as far as ITS and, and TSM and O, but just be uh, be aware that with new technology comes new issues and and new concerns uh, so that we have to work through. So that's about uh, all we had today, Brian. If uh, there's any questions, uh, we can certainly start going through those. I appreciate the time. Well, I, first of all, before we start any of this, I want to thank both of you gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time and efforts in developing and delivering that. That was uh, an incredibly uh, dynamic and, and interesting presentation. Um, we've got some questions here. I know you've got some that you had worked up as well, but one of the uh, one of the ones that I wanted to see if uh, you bear with me here is um, Mr. Raj Panaluri. He's a friend of mine over there in uh, traffic engineering and operations here at FDOT. <clears throat> he sent me a, uh, he, he wanted to try to get on the, on the mic and I apologize, I apologize to Raj. Uh, the way that I've set this up, I can't just open mics up to attendees, but he wanted me to see, uh, talk about smart work zone initiatives statewide here through FDOT. And I'm just gonna read this little thing off real quick and then we'll get on to your uh, Q and A. Uh, FDOT Traffic Engineering and Operations Office has advertised a request for information, RFI, soliciting industry response to SWZ technologies. Several SWZ technology vendors have responded to this RFI. Later, the central office organized vendor presentations to the FDOT engineers across the districts. FDOT central office and district office are collaborating to develop a work zone action plan that will also contain the SWZ, SWZ elements. This was identified. This was identified as one of the action items by the Vital Few Mobility Implementation Plan. A draft standard specification for smart work zone technologies is being considered. Uh, among the district initiatives, District Four is planning and designing a SWZ project titled as Southwest 10th Street Connector. 
District 5 has deployed a Q warning system on the I-4 Ultimate project and I-95. District 6 has implemented connected technology on the incident response vehicle fleet in Miami-Dade County. District 7 is planning and designing a, an SWZ project for the Tampa Bay Next Initiative. All districts are actively working with SWZ initiatives. <clears throat> Outreach and interactions, FDOT is working with FTPA, FTPA, apologies, and other leaders to improve safety of workers in the work zones. That's good. FDOT is deploying emerging technologies for the vital few, improving safety, enhancing mobility, inspiring innovation, and fostering workforce development. FDOT welcomes you to work with us to improve the safety in work zones. Thank you, Raj Panaluri. So that was all of that. Good stuff. A lot of good stuff, people working with SWZ. Uh, one of the questions coming up here, um, are the courts upholding virtual camera enforced speed violations that you know of? It's a, it's a state by state issue. Um, certainly, you know, this is a legal issue that has to be worked through each state and each jurisdiction. Um, and, it, and it's a lot of factors, legal factors into that. I can't really say for Florida, you know, how that has, has developed or not developed, but uh, it's just uh, something that has been tried, whether that's through a work zone or through uh, you know, municipalities around the country and from from uh, some of the, you know, results we've seen, you know, it, it's been, you know, it's hard to, to deny the benefits to, to safety. You know, I know people don't necessarily like uh, getting a bill in the mail, but uh, it, you know, from a safety standpoint is really what we're discussing. Good deal. Does the smart work zones communicate with mapping apps such as Google Maps? Glenn, feel free to jump in, but uh, certainly they can. Um, you know, some of the cities and, and communities around Florida and other states are starting to incorporate their mapping systems in with like Waze or Google or other features, uh, you know, other apps that are available out there. Uh, so some of the Waycare systems like in the city of Tampa and uh, in Waze are interfacing with, you know, ATMS systems that the city maintains. Uh, it provides more information to the cities and the communities and the agencies but also, uh, you know, similarly mirrors that information out back to those Waze apps and other things. Uh, but for instance, for smart work zones, um, you know, they, these are, I guess you'd call them portable or temporary devices, but they can be integrated into your existing sun guide system, just like a permanent device. And so it can, you know, monitor where that device is in the field. Uh, the operators can see it when it's moving, you know, on a trailer, you know, so it's, it can be integrated seamlessly to your sun guide system. Yeah, awesome. we've, seen that. we've seen that in Virginia. And the other thing is obviously with Waze and the relationship with Waze and Google, Google may basically owning Waze, stuff that you've got on Waze that's going, that's uh, particularly important will often show up on Google, as, Google Maps as well. So there is that tie. Uh, we've got, it, it, this is pretty much more of a comment in here, but it says, uh, nice to hear bicycle pedestrian. Thanks. Need to keep that in the forefront as the technology evolves. So there's always an interest for that in incorporating more of a, the complete street, so to speak. How receptible or capable are you finding the contractor community is dis deploying SWZs, heavy civil, MOT operators especially? Uh, in my experience, I mean, they're certainly willing to do it or, you know, willing to, to, to do anything that they are asked to do, uh, you know, it, it just depends on how you write the specs. A lot of times these specifications are written to give the contractor a lot of leeway on what they provide. And so when you're talking about large design build projects, you know, large construction projects that are low bid price arrangements, uh, you know, you're not going to get the most robust, you know, technology systems, the most expensive technology systems that, that maybe you want without specifically spelling that out. And so, uh, you know, contractors are very familiar with getting sub consultants in if they need, uh, you know, if they need some knowledge that they don't have on staff. I don't think that's a problem. It's just, you know, it's just about winning the job, though, right, to these guys. So, so Glenn, in your experience, performance. It's all about the for uh, the performance-based specifications. You don't you don't necessarily tell people that you need dynamic message signs, portable or whatever, because anybody can provide the technologies. It's how you use them. And so you need you need to have a strategy behind it 
and to, in order to meet the performance measures. So that strategy is what's important. Is that something that the contractor people necessarily have? No. As you mentioned, they see you're going to bring a consultant on, you're going to, you're going to bring your partner on who has that experience and very often maybe hands-on experience from a state DOT point of view who can actually implement it. So, you know, the tools are important. It's how you use the tools that's very important. Well, I, I think you're talking about this next question right there and you're leading into a little bit, but what systems do we need to implement smart work zone systems, SWZSs? So I think you, you started a little bit there, but do you want to elaborate yeah. a little? Yeah. Yeah. Just going through, you know, like I said, it, it, it doesn't require necessarily a lot of new systems. I mean, uh, you know, some of these vendors have their own uh, system, you know, a similar type of ATMS network and mapping features to map their devices. That can be shared with SunGuide in a similar, you know, the, the agency can actually log on and see that vendor, you know, application if they want to use that or, or interface it with SunGuide. Sometimes uh, some of the agencies may not have quite the database needs or the data vendor, I mean, the, the uh, data storage needs that they need if they're really going to get into the data that's that comes from all these devices, um, because you know you're getting you're getting a lot of information every day. You know, from every one of these these detectors and, and cameras and and, uh, and roadside units. So being able to to handle the data, store the data, manipulate the data, whatever you want to do with it, you know, and then analyze it. I mean, you know, that's a whole job in and of itself. Um, you know, but you know, make sure that you just go through your your typical systems engineering analysis. I mean, you know. There's a lot of things that you might need. Uh, there's a lot of things that you might not know you need until you start, you know, the, the work zone up. So it's important that you go through a, a real needs analysis and a real formal process in the planning stage to, to make sure you figure out your weaknesses, you know, and all your strengths before, you know, you start putting things on the on, you know, on the freeway. Uh, one next one here. Uh, why do we need to message connected or autonomous autonomous vehicles? Uh, when they are a small percentage of traffic? So I'd say currently, you know, it's it's a pretty small percentage of traffic. Uh, you know, it depends on the city and the community. Um, certainly a rural area is not going to have as many autonomous and vehicles and Tesla vehicles as, uh, as, a, as a larger city would. Uh, but certainly, you know, when we're talking about planning projects and we're talking about construction projects, they're, they're years in the future. You know, what we're working on today is going to be four, five, six years down the road. And at that point, you know, we could have a significantly higher number of connected vehicles on the freeway at that time. But even if it's only 10 or 20 percent, that's still 10 or 20 percent of, of vehicles and, and motorists that we can immediately communicate with who can impact other motorists around them You know, as a vehicle. You know, automatically brakes or starts to slow down. You know, it does affect vehicles around them that are not, you know, specifically connected. And you know, I, I do have high hopes, you know, that they'll have a lot of, you know, aftermarket devices at some point. You know, that you can use the Garmin type devices that you know you might be able to communicate, you know, to those roadside units. Yeah, and I think that's a very, very good question that was asked. I think the the emphasis on being able to take the information, let's say, from a vehicle directly being able to send it to the cloud so it can be made available to people through means other than let's say through uh, V2V communication, whether it's through Waze or through uh, another travel or information application uh, is going to be a way forward until the point that you have more connected vehicles or you have more direct communication to uh, an automated vehicle down the line 10 years from now or, or 15 years from now. Uh, so the CV to X part, communicating to the cloud and then finding a way to get that information as quickly as possible to the person via their CarPlay or their ways on their CarPlay or uh, Android Auto or whatever they interface they've got in the vehicle is going to be is going to be critical uh, in the short today and in the short term. You, yeah, you're absolutely right. Technology is changing every day, and there's no telling what uh, what alien technology is going to come out of Area 51 in the next five or ten years. So, good deal. Um, how do we use the SWZS in limited or zero right of way areas? Yeah, that that's a bigger, you know, starting to be a bigger issue. I mean, right of way is just becoming a bigger and bigger problem um, in everything we do. You know, as we start to develop, you know, and, and widen corridors that you know hardly have any right away already um, so you know 
there are going to be some cases where we don't have right away where we can't really fit trailers in um, so you're really going to have to either focus on the you know the outside areas you know approaching those those bottlenecks uh, or you know really heavily you know sign those areas and, and message those areas before you get into the the cattle chute so to speak or, or you know potentially you could put temporary devices on poles you know all sorts of wooden poles or things uh, right inside that that area if it's specifically like a bridge bottleneck or something that you're trying to work on but uh, it's, it's going to be harder. Certainly, it'll be a more uh, more labor and communication to move things around. But there's there's always some strategies uh, that that you can take, you know, around that area. Yeah, the Colorado example I think is is an ex excellent yeah. illustration of that. Where I mean, you can't you can't get any more restricted than uh, than taking uh, uh, two directions and putting them into a single two lane tunnel. Uh, so that can't get very more limited than that. And so you, you basically had to provide information much further away. You need to provide uh, alternate routes, provide the signs so you can divert traffic when you absolutely need to, uh, so they don't get stuck in there uh, at, at, you know, when it's too late. Uh, so I, I think that does directly impact how you do your work zone. You're not just worrying about what's physically happening in the work zone, you're worrying about getting too many vehicles into that zone to begin with. All right. Um, how will FCC ruling on DSRC affect future smart work zones? Yeah, Glenn, you want to you want to take that one? Yeah, and I think that's uh, first of all, that that's going to have uh, a great deal of impact on what a lot of people thought was going to happen which was that you were going to have all these vehicles were all going to be able to get live data from whatever was happening at the side of the road, whether it's other vehicles or whether it's a, a traffic signal information. Um, it's the information can still be achieved with the uh, technology that's emerging with the but the latency is really the big issue. So you're not going to have the immediate vehicle to vehicle information for a long time. 5G may change that over the long term, but the technology is not quite there. Again, I'm going to emphasize, do what it is that you can do. And right now, the technology of communicating to the cloud and having service providers provide information so the driver is smarter is probably going to be the way forward for now. And then as the technology evolves and you, and you begin getting the low latency technology that might be achievable with 5G, then you can look at some of the stuff. So yes, the DSRC uh, being taken away as an option by FCC uh, is, a, is a step backwards. And I'll say it right out, it is a step backwards. It is what it is, as they said. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would like to see, you know, some, it'd be great to at least try some of these, uh, you know, agency owned, you know, communication networks, maybe, you know, you build your own 5G system as part of a tolling agency or something so that you have, you know, complete complete control over uh, what's used and, and you can't be, you know, uh, flat-footed again if the FCC changes their minds. Uh, here's a question. What is the best way to make SWZ a part of standard practice where applicable? Does legislation or policy need to be passed? Streamline the access slash procurement of equipment and data. Um, you know, I, I would think it's just like in any other uh, work zone or, or ITS system. Um, certainly, when you get into enforcement, there's some legal issues and congressional issues. You know, certain signage, maybe VSLs, require you know some some legislative uh, discussion. But um, by and large, I mean, you know, it just follows the typical ITS approval process. Now, um, I'll be the first to tell you that there's a lot of uh, work zone issues, you know, work zone safety devices out there, and they don't all, you know, really accomplish what you want to accomplish. You have to be aware that you know, these are vendor-based uh, solutions, and so sometimes they're selling you a product that, you know, is beneficial for them. It doesn't necessarily work for your type of, of, of volume or your level of, of speed of traffic. I mean, you have to be, you know, do some due diligence and some, you know, demonstration projects to sort of prove, you know, what works best for your state and your area of the state. You know, but 
So, I mean, I think just like we've all we've done in ITS in the state as a whole, is it, it's a process. It, it takes a little bit of a, a testing and learning and improving, you know, to get to that full implementation. If you have a statewide goal or objective on what it is that you want to achieve, whether it's uh, with, uh, you know, zero, you know, a vision zero type objective, or whether you want to manage, uh, say, the duration of delay. A lot of, again, though that's that's performance related. But if there is if there is a statewide policy you want to implement, that's always a good way of kind of forcing the issue. If that's something that uh, that one believes is needed to improve improve the use of uh, or increase the use of smart work zones. Good deal. Um, just I know we're getting close to the time. Uh, there's just a couple of more comments here, and I like to try to uh, be inclusive to all the voices that we can. Um, this right here, the city of Tampa and FDOT District 7 are actively deploying WayCare as part of the FDOT City of Tampa ATMS project. So that's a, a statement. Then um, we have another one here says, as an update, the 2014 WZ ITS Implementation Guide will have a new appendix published in 2021 that includes fact sheets as well as draft specifications for each of the nine technologies listed on the WorkZoneSafety.org website. So apparently people trying to get information out there. Gentlemen, I really appreciate uh, your time and, and participation here within uh, our symposium webinar series. Keep in mind the 2021 uh, symposium webinar series will be uh, going on in this format as well. So if you want to get in, there is a link on our, on our website to submit your uh, topic. Um, other than that, Thank you for your time. I'm going to close out, let you guys say your goodbyes, and then we're just going to shut it on out for the day. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, everybody.